just a little bit of background about uh, the Quaking Aspen Challenge um, and how this came about. Really, it was a joint effort between many people, but principally myself and Hall Cushman, who you'll hear from just after me, and then Will Richardson. Uh, and and uh, as Moira said, this is a joint um, sponsorship by the Western Aspen Alliance and the Natural Areas Association. I want to say it's been a wonderful relationship uh, working with this group. Uh, you might also want to know that while I'm giving my presentation this morning, I might be just cooking an omelet in the background, so I'm in my kitchen here. Uh, but um, why Aspen? Uh, folks might not understand the importance of this species. I'm so glad that the sponsors uh, put Ben Goldfarb uh, speaking before us today because the synergy there will be apparent later in, uh, in my presentation. Um, but basically, this is a regionally a critical species that in some places is threatened, but it also has world implications. It has high value for ranching, recreation, uh, even real estate and tourism, and certainly wildlife uh, habitat. But there are many threats to these systems, uh, such as overbrowsing, fire suppression, and development and recreation. Um, I want folks to understand, and while I show these pictures, and particularly while you watch the break uh, video, that uh, we cannot um, overplay the aesthetics of Aspen. So we're, gonna, we're here to talk about science, but uh, let's keep those other dimensions in mind, why we love these places, because there's, there's sheer beauty and appreciation of these places as well. So uh, in Aspen management, and I would uh, posit in almost all natural resources management, the the driving paradigm is uh, that management should emulate uh, natural systems. That's a change in the last generation or so from more of a command and control uh, approach. So just how we're going to proceed here, we're going to kind of start big and overview E uh, with myself and Hall, and then we're going to kind of zoom more into the Sierra Nevada region uh, as we originally planned to have this conference in that area. So. Um, with that in mind, I'll move on to my presentation. Uh, oh, I should emphasize also why we think of this as a challenge. We hope to challenge your views. If you learned about Aspen Ecology 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, I wanna tell you there's a lot of change going on and you're gonna hear about that from our speakers today. Uh, but as I uh, also indicated, we're going to challenge um, this, this um, intersection, you might say, between uh, work and play between science and aesthetics uh, and why this species is so important. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to move right into my own presentation. Uh, sort of a tee up, I hope, for the uh, remaining speakers in this session uh, as I dance across a lot of topics here um, that are important in this, uh, in this uh, realm of study. So quaking aspen management in dynamic times, and they are very dynamic times for this species. Um, as Moira indicated, I work for the Western Aspen Alliance. It's based here at Utah State University. It's essentially a nonprofit that is uh, research and education focused. Um, I'm just going to have three main points and I'm going to try to cover. New findings, some things that might uh, surprise you or interest you that you might not know about, sort of the burgeoning areas of this field. And then dive in a little bit more about what's the problem here. Uh, why all the interest and what's going on, um, and then some effective action. So, so more in the management realm near the end. Some new findings. Uh, we've been told for decades that aspen seedlings are rare. It turns out that's not the case. We just didn't know how to look. In the center of your screen, those broadleaf uh, um, uh, plants are aspen. This may look a little like aspen to you, but these are aspen as well. We just didn't know how to look. Now that we focus our eyes and we understand how to find aspen seedlings, um, we're finding them in almost every wildfire uh, in the West that we've visited. We'll just go back quickly here. Uh, Co-sponsors uh, um, and that we're focusing on these uh, new aspects of aspen. Um, with my opening slide very quickly, who I work for, and then now we're on to the aspen seedlings. Uh, so these narrower leafed, um, plants here are actually true aspen seedlings. And so this adds genetic diversity, of course. Here's an aspen seeding event, probably a one in a billion prospect as to those that will actually 
uh, become fertile and germinate. And there's a, a whole raft of good papers uh, in the last decade that are documenting this. And I wanna to point to the one in the lower left there that just came out last month about how to identify seedlings versus suckers, because that's really important. I am not very talented at that. I haven't spent a lot of time doing that, but if we're gonna understand this, we're gonna to have, to, um, have to just begin with the identification. What we don't understand since this field is in its extreme infancy is what this means ecologically over time and space. How will this affect this species? A species that in some areas is threatened by various um, impacts that I'll get to in a minute. Another new finding that's on its way is looking at, uh, at ancient forests and fire uh, using um, charcoal as a field called pedoanthropology. Uh, this is a colleague of mine, Tony Kuspak from the Czech Republic, and we're here at the uh, Pando Aspen clone in central Utah, which I'll return to in a minute. But basically, um, looking at these tiny charcoal fragments and not only identifying species, but identifying how long in the past they existed through carbon dating and their relative abundance through time in different layers. And so that we can understand fire occurrence and what other competing, speci what other, um, competing species were at that site at that time. Uh, this is a little bit different than pollen. Uh, when you look at pollen studies, which collect pollen in a lake, and look at a watershed, this is more of an in situ study so that we know exactly what was happening at that site several thousand years ago. Um, just a quick illustration of that, on the right is a Palmer drought uh, index. To the left of the center line is droughty periods and to the right is uh, some moist periods over the last thousand years or so. And what we can do is line that up with, uh, this is a preliminary data from this study, with periods in which, for example, Douglas fir uh, had a little bit of a surge within the Pasto Pando clone, which is now considered a stable aspen community. I'll get back to that term in a little bit, but a community in which aspen grows purely and doesn't really uh, compete with other species. So a lot to unravel there in terms of back in time. Another important new finding, and this paper is in review as we speak, um, is the intersection between aspen, sage grouse, and climate. Uh, sage grouse ecology is uh, dependent on the idea that uh, sage grouse avoid trees because it's dangerous and predators live in trees. Uh, well, not so fast. You know, uh, as, uh, sage grouse are using these species, particularly at the lower um, uh, aspen uh, sagebrush ecotone uh, across the Great Basin, across the Colorado Plateau. Uh, and we're just finding out about this. But this study, basically, uh, this graphic shows that on the left, as you, you're nearer to the uh, aspen edge, there's a higher use by sage grouse during the brooding period, and lower as you go at distance from that. Um, again, this study will come out pretty soon, so it has great impacts potentially for sage grouse habitat, particularly upland habitat that's away from riparian areas where aspen is the relative moisture on the landscape, uh, but also on, on, on aspen ecology and how that interacts with herbivory. That photo in the background, that aspen stand is not reproducing very well and would be uh, soon collapsing. And, then, and just one species use of that sage grouse would diminish significantly. Another new finding is expanding our, our ass work uh, in the US and North America across the, the world and particularly focusing on world biodiversity and working with a number of colleagues in this paper published last year, in a review sense, uh, the value of biodiversity uh, is a unifying threat across the world in six different aspen species, undergoing some of the same threats that we're seeing here. And then grossly speaking, uh, here we have sort of a hypothetical, uh, since time one after disturbance, uh, aspen development with the yellow line uh, competing conifers in a cereal system, but as those two intersect and conifers perhaps take over shading and aspen declines, the most important line here is the aspen obligates. All that high biodiversity of, of species that depend on aspen systems and they follow that same traject trajectory, excuse me. So what is the problem here? Actually, there's a raft load of problems, which I don't have time to go into great detail about. This photo on the right is also from the Pando clone. This area uh, just surrounding these, uh, what, five or six remaining trees was cut 
25, uh, 30 years ago, uh, and there is no forest growing back there at all. Uh, this is part of the problem, and let me dive into that. We've been talking about aspen decline uh, for decades now. That's when conifers perhaps take over where aspen was more uh, predominant at some other time period, but not all, st all stands uh, are interacting with conifers, and so there's a different ecology there. Um, some of that, um, that aspen decline work uh, was faulted by methods that probably don't make a lot of sense and I don't have time to go into right now, but basically they were saying that every place that there was any aspen uh, was once dominated by aspen and that's not always true. Then we have sudden aspen decline, the sudden die off with drought of aspen. Um, and we find that to be often not true too, or at least in most regions of the West, that there's, there's complicating factors, interacting factors. Climate and drought certainly poses challenges to aspen, particularly where it's near its margins of existence, either lower elevation or quite a bit farther south in the US. Fire suppression uh, certainly had some impacts, but I would posit the idea that uh, climate through the 20th century had a much bigger impact uh, on, on forests in general, but also um, on aspen um, uh, decline, you might call it. Herbivory and wild, uh, both wild and domestic species is probably the largest issue across the West, in my opinion. We have development, varying forest priorities over time. Uh, I have some photos that I'm not going to show today in the Black Hills where Aspen was bulldozed in the 1960s just uh, because the priority there was to grow uh, timber species fast. Recreation, um, the overarching theme of this presentation is a disconnect or, or partial disconnect between management and science. And if there's one message you take home from this presentation is that all Aspen are not alike. So what is the problem? I'm just gonna nip at this really quickly. Um, there's a bunch of them uh, in terms of the borderlands, what we're calling now borderlands, and there's some other names for it, but land ownership between federal and state, between state and private, federal and private, and so on, um, where things are managed differently on one side of the fence versus the other. In this photo near, um, so in Southern Idaho, near uh, Craters of the Moon National Park, uh, a bear broke into this uh, person's yurt. It's a mild development as development goes, but the adjacent aspen habitat has something to do with that. Um, how we live and, uh, uh, and work in these environments where, um, where, where federal lands, in this case, affect private lands, is an important issue that's getting more and more airtime. Uh, in herbivory, we have this, what we call a refuge effect, where the animals uh, very much know when hunting season starts, and that's not a joke, and they turn up in inordinate numbers on uh, private lands and other lands where hunting's not allowed, for example, reserved areas such as national parks or state parks. And those areas get um, undue amount of impact from herbivores. Now, now I'm talking about wild herbivores predominantly there. And then of course fire. Um, we manage things on one side of the fence versus the other and the fire uh, may not recognize that as this, uh, this photo from Alaska indicates. So how do we take effective action? I've tried to live my career with this quote in mind. Uh, to keep every cog and wheel um, is the uh, intelligent tinkering, the first precaution. So we got to kind of understand Aspen is not all alike. We have these stable systems on the left there where there, it's predominantly Aspen for many generations. I'm not talking about 10 or 20 years after a disturbance, but for hundreds of years, perhaps millennia. And on the right, we have some kind of competition or interaction uh, with conifers. We'd call that maybe traditional uh, aspen ecology. And there's all different kinds of subgroups there, perhaps in the, in the Canadian parklands, and you have these sort of south aspect in this photo in the lower left, the second one over, uh, versus north aspect, and we have cereal and stable aspen right up against each other across the Colorado Plateau, huge stands of pure aspen. And then this terrain isolated is actually a a um, lateral moraine in southeast Idaho. We have these other types in cereal communities, montane and boreal uh, aspen. Um, and then we have some crossover types in riparian. We have kind of both types may exist there. 
the overarching message here is that we need to understand those systems in order to manage, restore, and or just interact with them in a um, ecologically sound fashion. So effective action. Um, this uh, guide in the lower left there uh, is a free guide on our website that's uh, done with BLM money and I have hard copies as well if people are interested in those. But basically to lay out a system, and this is really common sense, but we often lose track of where we're going uh, and especially as um, resources get pinched, money, time, people, and so on. But understanding these issues, what type of Aspen, what's the ecology of that system, as best we can, we cannot nail that down perfectly, but as best we can. Understand the issues, bringing in more and more people. This is also contingent on the idea that we're dealing in an era of collaborative problem solving, often multi-agency, private, public, and so on. Understanding those causes, uh, coming up with a plan. This middle part is sort of, you know, um, land use management 101 take some action, but um, where we often drop off is not following up with monitoring and monitoring that drives the system. Monitoring is often put at the back of your report and it's the first thing to get dropped when you lose funding. And so setting up this cycle that's contingent upon monitoring, that monitoring is front and center is, a, is the basis of this whole approach. By the way, this photo is taken just two weeks ago at a workshop we did in Southwest Montana. So here's how we can have ineffective action. This is the Pando clone outlined in yellow. We have a few different management sections there, a fenced area that was successful on the right in red and the left that was unsuccessful, at least initially, and then about half of the whole Pando not fenced. Um, and we were looking specifically at understory vegetation and diversity. To give up the punchline there, since I don't have time to go into the details of the study, is that uh, this perhaps the most uniform forest in the world of this size is diverging with three different plant community types. And we found that out through using an ordination process uh, called non-metric multidimensional scaling, but you can see these symbols that represent the different management types, no fence, a 2013 fence that's effective and a 2014 fence that was being breached by, uh, and this is predominantly, wa predominantly wildlife, in this case mule deer, but they really separate out in terms of the plant species and in terms of the factors that influence them. The most prominent factor being uh, successful regeneration is highly mitigated by deer and uh, cattle access. And that's using a surrogate of cattle, um, cattle scat. And then overall production and fecundity of aspen on site, um, interestingly, is in opposition to higher diversity. So more light uh, gave us more diversity. But the most important thing is there that you have three different, um, three different forests, essentially, in, in a very uniform, genetically uniform 106-acre forest. And, and, and again, trying to cut to the chase here, there's a number of interacting factors and they're centrally driven by human decisions. So effective action, these, these individuals from uh, um, Wyoming Fish and Game in the red shirts are standing in the middle of a former Aspen forest in a fairly dry site in Southwest Wyoming. And we're all, after we finished crying, um, we're all pondering kind of what went wrong and what we can do. And it's an intensely browsed system that's subject to high drought. Well, we can take preventative matters such as building a number of kinds of fences, everything from wire to this buck and pole to um, using materials on site to just stack things and prevent um, wildlife from getting in there. Uh, but we shouldn't lose sight of the, the base causal agents. In many areas, there are too many wildlife without significant predation. And I'm talking specifically now about elk and deer, uh, in addition to domestic livestock, cattle and sheep. So we can take preventative action or we can take adaptive action uh, or combine the two. But basically this is a fire also in Wyoming in which uh, two years later we have some regrowth, but it's very stunted because of browsing. And so the crew is sitting around thinking, okay, how do we alter our, um, how do we alter our management because our monitoring is showing we're getting no regrowth 
and we have a dying forest. So the combination of fire and browsing or drought and browsing is deadly in many uh, aspen forests. So some other effective actions, there's um, prescribed burning. Again, you wanna monitor first to see if you have a browsing issue or some other issue before you take action and then perhaps take some actions to mitigate that before you uh, lay your total bet on the table, so to speak. Uh, in stable community here, um, experimentally, this is a relatively small stand, again, somewhat low elevation, dry around there, to cut a lot of it, but to strategically scatter it. It looks like a mess to you and I, but they've tried to um, uh, stop animals from easily walking in there and browsing everything. And this is experimental. These pink flags are the annual monitoring plots that they're going to go in there every year and, and look at. And, uh, and, and see how that goes and adjust if they have to. In a serial community in Eastern Utah, they use this special fencing with a gap at the bottom and, and over the gentleman's shoulder there, you can see a successful recruitment. And recruitment is defined as those aspen suckers that get above the height of the browsing animals. And then finally, another cool experimental approach uh, that seems to be successful so far is in, in the Black Hills in South Dakota of using this hinging method we cut a tree most of the way through, but let it sit on the stump at a high cut. And then it also impedes animals from going through. And you can do that throughout the stand, or you can do that around the edge if you have enough trees to construct a fence out of uh, on-site materials. So finally, effective action. Um, this is a site, uh, Spawn Creek, near where I live in northeastern Utah that's subjected to, uh, and this is in deference to uh, Ben Goldfarb's presentation, uh, intense uh, beaver um, habitat development, you might say. Cattle have been blocked out of there. Um, some people would call this do nothing. I'm baffled by that, by that phrase, but it's often used in a cynical fashion by land managers, this to do nothing. And you might look at this, particularly if you're coming from a forestry perspective and say, this looks horrible. Well, first of all, this is in the spring and not all the leaves are out on the aspen. But what we have here is aspen of all ages. We have a, an expanded wetland in the base and we have the interaction of two keystone species, beaver and aspen doing amazing things. The avian diversity on this site was through the roof. The plant diversity, because you have all of these different, um, these different age groups is fantastic. So, um, we got to look again. And overall, we need to talk to each other. Uh, Cross-agency, interdisciplinary, transboundary to get things done. And I heard some speakers allude to that yesterday when I was sitting in on the conference, but it's pretty critical. Uh, sometimes the uh, passive management approach is the right thing, but I wouldn't say we're doing nothing. We're understanding the ecology and working with that system. So with that in mind, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, recommend you go to our website if you're interested in Aspen ecology or educational materials. And I want to finally thank the people who sponsor uh, my work, Bureau of Land Management, Philanthropic Organizations, and of course, Utah State University and the Ecology Center here at Utah State.